Welcome to The Gold Exchange with Keith Wiener, where we untangle market and policy complexity using timeless economic principles. For show notes and archives, go to goldexchangepodcast.com. And now, on to today's episode. Hello again, and welcome to The Gold Exchange Podcast. I'm John Flaherty, and I'm here with Keith Wiener, founder and CEO of Monetary Metals. Today, we're going to get into uh, a topic that we've received a lot of questions about, and that is um, investing principles for precious metals investors. We are not going to give investment advice on this episode, but instead try to keep uh, principles general in nature. For those who are brand new to precious metals investing, I'd invite you to see our guide um, at interestongold.com. Keith, I'm really curious, when did gold and silver enter your consciousness as something that might be a good idea to own and what were ultimately some of the main reasons why you decided to acquire them? So I was always aware, you know, I, I started um, reading Ayn Rand in the mid 1980s uh, in college. So I was always aware of the idea of gold as, you know, something they can't, you know, debase. But all during those, you know, years, obviously as a poor college student and then, you know, working to build my own company, it wasn't something I really revisited uh, until I sold my company, which was a company called Diamond Wear. I sold that to Nortel Networks, August 19th, 2008. And I put the emphasis on the date because that was really just before the mainstream financial world went over, you know, crashed and went over the edge into the abyss. You know, going through that, sitting there with 100% of my wealth, uh, essentially in cash held in a couple of too big to fail banks and every day reading the news and big banks were failing. I mean, there was Lehman Brothers, there was... Bear Stearns, uh, obviously before that, uh, countrywide, you know, there was, there was so much going on. It was, it was at first, I kind of felt a little bemused uh, because I'd had my transaction, I felt good. But then as the fall continued to progress and there was more and more, you know, not just bad news, but crazy, crazy news of what was going on. You know, there was an incident where the secretary of the treasury, Hank Paulson called, I'm trying to remember what his name was, but he was the CEO of Bank of America. And Bank of America was in the process of acquiring, um, I don't know if it was Countrywide or Merrill Lynch. It was one of those acquisition deals. During, during the time of Bank of America's due diligence, they discovered some, you know, what's called a material adverse change. In other words, conditions that the company they were acquiring got worse. And they said, look, the deal's off. We don't want to do this anymore. This thing is deteriorating by the minute. You know, imagine if you're thinking of buying a car and then uh, during the time you say, okay, I'll come back next Friday with the money. And in the meantime, the car has been in an accident and you're like, I don't want to buy it anymore. I thought it was, you know, it was an intact car. Now it's now the frame's all, you know, bent. So, um, Hank Paulson summons this guy to Washington DC on Friday evening, he takes him into some basement room, uh, at, in the treasury building. You know, we don't exactly know what happened, but to put it in Godfather terms, he made him an offer he couldn't refuse. <laughs> and so by, by Sunday, the CEO was, was, you know, on the news saying, yeah, yeah, we're going to continue with the acquisition after all. So you may watch all this and you're like, this is nuts. Is there, uh, uh an escape hatch? I mean, how do I, um, and, and Bank of America was one of the banks I had had you know, cash in at that time. And I'm just looking at this saying, how do I protect myself? Where do you get out to? How do you escape this? And, um, you know, ding, ding, ding gold, um, suggested itself as uh, a logical place to be. So for me, that was fall of 2008. And it was it was the, the crazy events that were occurring at that time. Do you remember when the Cyprus bail-ins were occurring? Was that sort of a, a parallel event that surely would have spooked you and everyone else who was watching it? You know, I think, so it's funny. Um, I actually reached out to a gold bullion dealer in Nicosia, which is the big city, um, such as it is in, in Cyprus, to ask him a few questions. And I wrote an article about it back, uh, what, what year was that, 2011 or something. That news story didn't really circulate amongst mainstream, you know, anything in America, right? So unless you're reading the alternative, you know, sites like Zero Hedge, you probably didn't even know that happened. The Europeans, especially in Southern Europe, would obviously being much closer, would probably been more aware of it. I, you know, I reached out to this bu bullion dealer in Nicosia, Cyprus, and I asked him, about, you know, did he know what was going to happen before it happened? You know, was there advance warning? And he said, you know, I, I tried to tell everybody, but they wouldn't listen. You should buy gold. 
you know, and he had that sort of tragic sort of Greek sense of, I told everybody they wouldn't listen. Woe is me. You know, I'm Cassandra, uh, you know, kind of thing about him. Now, what's interesting is that the purpose of buying gold, if you were in Cyprus at that time, the reason why you should have bought gold wasn't that the price of gold was about to go up in, in Euro terms. In my recollection, it didn't actually go up. However, once the banking system collapsed in Cyprus, uh, if you had a thousand euros in the bank, you couldn't do anything with it. You were basically trapped. You, you're screwed. But if you had bought gold, you know, that gold would have been good. You could have gotten onto a boat and obviously jobs, you know, dried up in Cyprus. I mean, the economy was, was a train wreck at that point. Uh, but if you wanted a job, you could have gone to, to mainland Europe. You know, any citizen of Europe can get a job anywhere. It's just like moving from North Carolina to New York. And you could have just paid for your passage on a boat with gold. You know, gold, gold was accepted and gold would be accepted. So you're getting out of uh, uh, unsound credit, which is banking system credit in Cyprus, into something that's, you know, nobody questions, which is gold. And, 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 as he, and he said to me, nobody did it. He did not see an increase in his business selling gold in the lead up to that banking system uh, um, holiday and then restrictions and then ultimately bail in. So that's why he was so frustrated <laughs> he was waiting for the spike in business and it never materialized. He was, he was right. <laughs> trying to make more money and it didn't happen. Right. So Keith, do you favor gold over silver? Uh, I mean, is this just a case of Coke versus Pepsi or what are your thoughts there? It actually gets into two questions, which is why are there two precious metals that both compete to be money? And then, you know, which one do I favor at the moment and, and why? And the first one uh, is a very interesting question because usually these things are winner take all. I mean, given enough years or in the case, you know, of precious metals, thousands of years, one of them should have been, you know, not only dominant, but ultimately win. And that's not the case. And the reason is that, so gold is the most efficient commodity as, as a medium of exchange because it's been asked spread you know, the loss that you take to buy and sell it is, is narrower than for any other commodity. Uh, but silver actually has a role, and that's because if you're a wage earner and you want to set aside 10% of your salary to buy precious metals, 2,000 years ago as today, if you wanted to buy gold with 10% of your weekly paycheck, that would be a very small amount of gold. I mean, it would be easy to lose it in a lint in your pocket, and then it's very expensive to buy very small slivers or wafers of gold. But for silver... You know, you could get for 10% of your wage, you know, you'd get three or four or five ounces and a one ounce silver coins, a nice big piece. So it's more satisfying to hold it in the hand to have a stack of silver coins than to hold this, you know, tiny little wafer of gold um, and much more economically efficient. The, the loss, the bid ask spread on, you know, that quantity of silver would be much tighter than gold. So uh, silver was always the solution for wage earners that wanted to save. Uh, and, that, and that's still true today. I mean, people want to hoard precious metals, they want to take it home. They don't want to hold a banking system deposit of, of gold or silver, which isn't even possible anyway uh, today for the most part. But uh, the price of gold and the price of silver fluctuate against each other. And so there's something called the gold-silver ratio that I you know, uh, encourage everybody to take a look. Charts of this are available all over the place. And uh, unsurprisingly, there's kind of a cycle, right? So silver will never go to zero against gold. Silver will never get anywhere near the price of gold. For, for a lot of historic and uh, you know, physical reasons, but they, they fluctuate in a range. And so back in the era, let's say before the 19th century, because governments began to distort things, even from the time of the founding of America, they began to distort it. And the Coinage Act of 1792 fixed the price of silver in terms of gold. And whenever a government tries to price fix, you get distortions and you get perverse outcomes from that. But you know, looking at uh, the 18th century and earlier, there, there was a, a ratio of gold to silver that was about uh, 15 and a half to one. In other words, 15 and a half ounces of silver to buy an ounce of gold. And uh, so that's the absolute low end on the, on the gold-silver ratio. I think for modern times, one should probably assume a low end of about 30. And that's where the ratio hit in, um, I don't know if it was March or April of 2011, when the silver price hit its absolute spike high. You know, you had this gold-silver ratio of about 30. So, so, so if the, if the ratio is 30, you should favor gold because this ratio is only going to go in one direction. And that is gold's going to go up relative to silver or silver is going to go down relative to gold. And so at 30, you have no upside to owning silver, only downside. Um, and silver being the more volatile of the two, that downside is, um, 
you know, is, is a factor that, that should be considered. Uh, and then the upside on the ratio, one might have assumed that the, uh, the, the highest the ratio would go would be about 85 till, you know, the last couple of years when, um, you know, the ratio hit, uh, it was well over 100. I want to say 110, maybe 120. I'll have to go back and look at my you know, charts. It's been a while and the ratio has been falling since then. Um, but anyways, if the ratio is, let's call it, a, a, you know, 100 or even over 85, then silver is the better bet because, you know, chance, especially if you're willing to hold for some period of time, chances are silver will rise against gold. Uh, and it did. And now the ratio is, is closer to the low 70s. You know, today in the low 70s, preponderance would suggest, you know, if there's a reversion to the mean, would suggest the ratio would probably continue to fall, which means silver is better to own. I also think silver, the silver price is showing a bit more momentum, you know, in the, in the medium term. So silver is probably a bit better, but you know, one should always be doing that in light of where the gold silver ratio is. Got it. You know, I, I should add one other thing. We have some interesting charts on the monetary metals website that look at the internals of the gold and silver markets and the fundamentals of the two. And, uh, that can also, help. so not only should you be informed by where the ratio is in, compared to its historic, uh, uh, cycle, but also looking at the fundamentals of, of gold and silver, and that will give you some, some, in, it's not really trading advice, but it'll give you some indication as to, you know, which market is more in surplus and which market is more in uh, shortage. Great. Thank you. So Keith, for the average precious metal investor, what are some key principles to keep in mind? You know, I, I think the biggie is that, um, of course, the dollar is always being debased. The Fed, you know, and this is no conspiracy theory uh, that you have to read, read on the dark web. The Fed publishes its official uh, monetary policy, and that calls for, it's kind of Orwellian, uh, it calls for price stability, which, which doesn't mean price stability. It means relentless 2% debasement forever. The, so the Fed has a, um, a policy target of 2%. They want consumer prices to go up 2% for a year and they measure the dollar against consumer prices. In uh, August, September, I don't remember what exact month, they loosened their policy stance. And they said, well, 2% is still our target, you know, over the long run. But uh, over the short run, we're gonna allow inflation to exceed that uh, because, you know, over the last 10 years, we haven't actually hit our policy goal. And we tried to get to 2% and we failed. And so now going forward, we're gonna be even more aggressive. And if we start to achieve inflation, we'll be even more tolerant of it to make up for, you know, lost time, which is disingenuous on so many levels. One of which is how exactly do they fail to hit their policy target? And, and that's because the Fed doesn't really understand how it works. They can't actually create the inflation that they um, think they can. But from a perspective of anybody with savings to try to protect, the Fed is relentlessly trying to make the dollar worth less than it was. They're trying to aid debtors in, um, you know, easing their burden by making the dollar go down in value so that, you know, whatever it is you owe, you owe less in real terms. That's the reason why people, one of the reasons why people think about buying gold and silver. But the flip side to that is that prices are volatile. You know, you cannot assume that just because the Fed is debasing that if you buy gold today, the price will go up, you know, by tomorrow. Maybe, maybe not. That's, you know, just something to always keep in mind. What's your time frame? Gotcha. So yeah, get into that a little bit. How does time, time preference or how should time preference come into play uh, as someone is approaching uh, this investment? Well, so time preference would be a different concept. Uh, in, the, in my previous answer, I'm just saying, if you're planning to pay your taxes on April 15 and you've got $1,000 that isn't doing anything between now and then, and you think to buy gold, it's not a free money machine. And if you buy $1,000 worth of gold today, just a bit over half an ounce, that does not mean that by April 15, when you need to sell, because you have to pay your tax bill, that the price will be up and that you'll be able to sell it for $1,100. Maybe there's a lot of reasons to think that's more likely than not, but um, there's no guarantee of that. So moving on to time preference, time preference is the idea that it's better to have a bird in the hand versus two in the bush, or it's better to have something today versus the promise of something, uh, the same something tomorrow. And um, so time preference leads to uh, an interest rate. If, 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 if you had a choice that I was going to pay you today or I was going to pay you next year, and I was going to pay you the same amount either way, you'd say, well, just pay me now. If you're going to pay me next year, I want you to pay me a little bit more because 
even aside from the risk of whether or not the debtor honors his word, which is a risk, there's also, it's better to have something today versus tomorrow. We, you know, everybody has to eat today. Everybody has to, you know, heat or cool their homes and put fuel in the car, pay for electricity to connect to the internet and listen to uh, podcasts from, you know, from, from Keith and John. And, and all those things are, are today things. Uh, there's a natural preference to value something that you have in your hand versus something that you will potentially maybe in the future have in your hand. Gotcha. What about leverage? Should one borrow dollars uh, to buy precious metals? It's a seemingly attractive proposition, right? I mean, the price of gold tends to go up because the dollar is tending to go down. So borrow in the thing that's going down in order to buy the thing that's going up. And the problem is volatility. At the moment you put that trade on, you know, if that happens to be a local peak in the, in the gold price. <clears throat> so if you look at a long-term graph, there's local minima and local maxima. And then over time, the trend is rising. But in the meantime, you, know, you can have a drop. I'm not, as, as readers of my uh, writings know, I'm not a fan of John Maynard Keynes. But he did say one thing that was absolutely right. And that is markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. So if you borrow, uh, and I wouldn't say to people to do it, I wouldn't necessarily say not to do it. I certainly say go in with your eyes open and be very, very careful. But if you do it, um, be mindful that the price can drop and, um, you know, set stop orders and, you know, be really careful in, in how you manage that trade. Right. I think uh, if you asked anyone who has shorted Tesla in the last year, they, they can uh, resonate with that Keynes quote. <laughs> okay. Monetary Metals has put together an interesting white paper about the benefits of allocating gold uh, in one's portfolio. Will you please share some of the highlights of that paper, that document? Sure. So, you know, most of the major banks, their, their private wealth groups have done research over uh, many years looking at what if you, what if you began with a baseline, you know, standard portfolio of 60% equities, 40% bonds, and then you looked at the performance just strictly in dollar terms. Uh, you looked at the performance of that portfolio over many decades. Uh, you get certain measures, obviously there's total return, but there's also volatility and volatility matters because to get the same return, if two portfolios got the same return over let's say a 10 year period, and one was more volatile than the other, you know, most investors would choose the less volatile portfolio and particularly investors looking at drawdowns, right? So let's say you put a thousand dollars in and 10 years from now, it's going to be worth $10,000 and that's great, but there's going to be a moment next year when it's worth, it goes down to $400 and then eventually goes back up. Well, what are you going to do when it goes down to $400? Is that going to be good for your blood pressure? Uh, are you going to be tempted to sell? Uh, are your you know wife and family going to be beating you about the head and neck with, um, you know, wet noodle. Uh, you know, you can measure uh, not only returns, but drawdowns, volatility, you know, sort of volatility adjusted return or sharp ratio. And so what these, what these banks found in their research was if you put a small um, slug of gold, let's say uh, 4%, so a tiny portion of the portfolio, you put that into gold. What that does is it reduces volatility, reduces drawdowns, slightly enhanced returns, but not, I mean, obviously at 4%, it's not going to do that much overall. Um, but, you know, the returns got slightly better as well. Okay, great. And that's, you know, that's an argument that um, a lot of people make for owning gold. And maybe for, you know, for retail investors, uh, if they're going to own gold by taking it home physically and, uh, you know, storing it, uh, you know, under the floorboards, as it were, th then those numbers are, are, are accurate. But if you are a bigger investor, you know, let's say you're talking about a few hundred thousand dollars worth of gold. It's not really advisable to keep that kind of wealth at home. I mean, you can't insure it. You're now at risk of a home invasion. If anybody finds out about it, obviously fire, flood, all those kinds of things. And so in that case, you have to store it at a professional depository. And when you do that, now you suddenly are paying, we, we made an assumption of 50 basis points, 0.5% per year in storage costs. And when you do that, then the, then the scenario with gold in the portfolio gets, you know, a bit more sour, uh, you know, certainly drags down returns, volatility and drawdowns are a bit worse than the other scenario. And when, when you do that and you plot that, and that's, you know, I guess you'd call that making a steel man. So a straw man argument is when you mischaracterize your opponent's argument in order to uh, easily knock it down. A steel man is when you go out of your way, you bend over backwards 
to make the strongest possible argument for your opponent um, and then say you still overcome it. So if you steal man, you know, the argument you should have gold in the portfolio and you put in the, uh, the cost to carry, you know, the storage costs, uh, you know, you can see why, uh, you know, certainly institutional investors don't generally put gold in the portfolio. Um, and then anyways, then we did a third series where we ran the data and said, what if you didn't pay to store your gold? What if instead, obviously, you know, if you invest it with us, we pay interest on gold. That's our whole point of our business. Um, what if you were earning interest on gold? Then what, what do the numbers look like? And unsurprisingly, drawdowns got even smaller. Volatility was even less. Sharp ratio was improved. And of course, total returns uh, for the portfolio just run way ahead of any other version of the portfolio. And so in, you know, interest is the key. You know, essentially, the conclusion of that exercise, interest is the key. If you have to pay, if you get negative interest on your gold, it's not so attractive. If you get positive interest on it, it becomes pretty sweet. That's great stuff. We'll put a link to that paper in our show notes. I guess if you'd like to have some fun, you can share it with your uh, investment advisor and ask them why they didn't bring this to your attention earlier, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Keith, can you draw a distinction between investment and speculation and then tie this um, to what you've said about gold? Yeah, so obviously a lot, I mean, the tie to gold is pretty simple. Uh, a lot of people buy gold hoping for the price to go up. This is one of those contentious areas and everybody hears these words speculation and investment and um, has a sort of a, a gut, you know, gestalt feeling as, as to what they mean. And, and usually people try to define it in terms of how much perceived risk there is. So speculation is a risky investment and investment in whatever it is you think isn't, isn't risky. Some people think Tesla is a surefire thing to take over the world or Apple, Google, treasury bonds. But I, I define it a bit differently uh, thinking about it in economics terms. And that is if you, are financing productive activity. So if somebody wants to produce something, that means they're going to either increase the production of something that's valuable, or they're going to produce something new that's going to be valuable. They're making the world a wealthier, better place for humanity, and they're making money. The investors who finance that, their profits on the investment come from part of the profits that come from the new production. So the, the entrepreneur is creating something and the investor is getting part of that creation. Um, so economically, investment is uh, a very good thing. Speculation is, you know, let's say you buy a house, uh, or let's say your parents or grandparents bought a house in, you know, 1962, and they paid $22,000 for it. The same house, you know, today might be selling for, you know, $2 million if it's in the right location. You know, nothing's changed. It's still the same little 6,000 square foot lot. It's still the same you know, literally brick and mortar and, uh, uh, and wood structure, you know, maybe somebody's put in new granite countertops or something, but it's the same house. But in that case, you know, obviously somebody bought it to live in, but today, and in those days, nobody was buying houses to speculate or very few, but today people can buy houses, you know, wait a few months and then, and then flip them, uh, and, and count on the fact that house prices are rising at quite a ferocious rate at the moment. And so in a speculation, and whether it's, whether you buy gold, whether you buy Bitcoin, whether you buy houses, whether you buy equities, whether you buy um, 1982 Rothschild Latif uh, Cabernet, uh, no, it wouldn't be Cabernet Bordeaux or whatever, whether you buy, uh, you know, fine old whiskey, whether you buy Picasso paintings, whether you buy antique Ferraris, it's the same, same action. You buy this thing, uh, which means you fork over some of your wealth to the, to the seller. And the reason why you do that is you expect the next speculator to fork over an even larger amount of his wealth. So, you know, you buy Bitcoin at, um, you know, <laughs> at, at almost uh, as a bizarre number to say for $40,000. Um, and you do that because you expect the next speculator to buy it off of you at $80,000. Assuming that you take your initial capital investment back out, you take your 40,000 and let's say 10% as your, as your profit, you know, that leaves you $36,000 in gain your gain comes from somebody else's wealth, but it's converted to your income. It's a process of conversion of one person's wealth to another person's income. You know, if you look at the biblical story of the prodigal son, you know, there's a really important uh, parable there, which is you shouldn't want to, no, and in fact, I think very, very few people want to spend their life savings or their family legacy. Uh, Cause it's pretty clear if you're doing that, that you're just, you know, eating yourself out of house and home literally. 
But if through, you know, through indirect mechanisms or markets, uh, people are happy to consume someone else's life savings, which is coming to them as their income, that's their rightful profit. And so I make this distinction and say an investment is when you're financing something productive and the profit comes from that productivity, that increase in productivity. And speculation is when you're simply betting on the price action and your profit comes from the next speculator's wealth. And when you look at it that way, you realize that the destruction is actually occurring on the way up. I mean, everyone realizes if you're the last guy to buy at the absolute highest price. So if you bought silver in early April, I think it was 2011, and you paid $49 and 80 cents an ounce or whatever it hit as the absolute top tick. Everyone understands that within a matter of weeks, as you're staring at a $30 silver price, that you've lost $18 or, you know, it's, you know, a third of your uh, um, capital is gone, but it, it's more subtle and, and people don't think about the, the losses are actually occurring on the way up. Keith, that's, uh, that's some deep stuff. I think, um, I think it takes a little bit of uh, concentration to really get to the bedrock of the point you're making about capital being destroyed on the way up in a speculation. So before we close, can you just comment on any other principles you'd like to highlight? Yeah, I think the overarching point of all this is that it's the dollar that's going down. And um, so I use the analogy of suppose you're on the deck of a ship and the ship is tossing around in stormy seas, which represent volatility of markets. And the ship is also sinking. It has a hole in it and it's taking on water. And that represents the fact the dollar is being debased. You know, looking at gold from the dollar's perspective is rather like being on the deck of this sinking ship in a stormy sea, looking at the lighthouse, saying the lighthouse is volatile and the lighthouse is going up and down and mostly up. Uh, it's a, uh, an artifact of having the wrong vantage point. And so rather than looking at gold as going up and saying, well, gold is $1,850 roughly today, I would encourage people to measure the dollar in terms of gold and say, it's the dollar that's going down and that you know the dollar is roughly 16.8 milligrams of gold is the current price of the dollar. You know, will, will the dollar go up or down from here? Um, I'm sure it'll do both, but the trend is largely down because they are succeeding in uh, debasing it. So yeah, you often talk about the paradigm shift that has to occur and it's fun to watch with monetary metals investors as they get their monthly statements and see their gold and silver balances rising. And yes, we, we do the courtesy of extending to the dollar price, but um, to watch those ounces slowly uh, earn a return or, or accumulate a return is, is definitely this paradigm shift that um, I think we're trying to promote. Well, that's all the time we have today. Thank you for joining us on the Gold Exchange. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Go to goldexchangepodcast.com to learn how you can earn a yield on gold paid in gold.